Welcome to the Texas Values Report. This is Jonathan Sines, president of Texas Values. Great to be with you on another glorious week in the state of Texas. Hey, I hope you and your family had a wonderful Easter weekend and a great Holy Week last week. If you're new to the show, we have been running this show for coming up on, I think it's been over five years now. I feel like I've been saying four years for now, a year. We started the show in March, I believe, of 2015. I go back and check my dates, uh, but over 200 consecutive episodes running. And for the past year or so, though, we've been doing it on Facebook Live. So I know a lot of people are doing videos this time of year because of the coronavirus and so on. But we stream this as a part of our radio show every week at around 9 or 930. But you can also hear it on a local radio station in Central Texas, The Bridge. Of course, we're going to put it on podcasts and all kinds of stuff electronically. A lot of times afterwards, we'll put these things on YouTube. So you may be watching on YouTube. But we talk about the issues of faith, family, and freedom once a week in our 30 minute segment. And that's what we're gonna be doing today. If you know anything about our work, you know that we focus on the courts, the legislature and the media as they relate to the state of Texas. Now, sometimes we'll talk about things going in other parts of the country because we know that they can impact what happens in Texas and vice versa. And so we're gonna have a great show today. I'm excited about it. A lot going on in the state of Texas, maybe a new mood, maybe kind of a change of things, a new direction after Easter, and so that's something to be encouraged by. We don't really know how things are going to turn out just yet. We know the governor is going to make an announcement sometime today with a plan to start reopening things and really getting the economy back going in the direction it was. And so we'll get into a little bit of that detail. Who knows? I don't remember what time the, uh, the governor's press conference is. So maybe um, our communications associate, James, can tip me off on that because I'm uh, or remind me. I think it's a little bit later in the day. Hopefully it's not in the middle of while we're doing the show because that might change the impact of how many people are viewing our video and radio segment. But if you're watching on Facebook, go ahead and share this to friends so more people can watch it because we're about to get into a really interesting segment. We're going to be talking with Ryan Tucker of Alliance Defending Freedom. They are a national organization, a nonprofit organization that works on the same issues that we're working on, but they focus primarily on litigation. And so some really important court cases that have come up over the weekend and early this week relating to Easter services that um, where churches have had to navigate and deal with these restrictions and law enforcement measures that have gone too far. But we'll get into that in just a minute. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just got a note. It's at noon, the governor's press conference. So you got plenty of time to watch us here live as we get into some of these issues. But I want to bring in Jonathan Covey. Jonathan Covey is the newest member of the Texas Values team. He is the uh, new director of policy for Texas Values. Just to tell you a little bit about Mr. Covey, we use the word Covey and not, we, we now have three Jonathans that are part of the work we do at Texas Values. But he uh, grew up in Texas, native Texan from East Texas, has worked for a member of Congress, also was chief of staff for James White out in East Texas, and then was uh, for many years a senior advisor, a senior policy advisor for Senator Bob Hall. He's got his undergraduate degree and law degree, and he lives right here in the Central Texas area with his wife. Jonathan, it's great to have you part of the team. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background and why you were interested in coming to work for Texas Values. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Um, you, you covered it pretty well. My background and uh, experience comes mostly from working in the state legislature, both on the House side and the Senate side. I worked as a chief of staff for a state representative. And like you mentioned, I worked as a senior policy advisor for a state senator for about four years. Um, had a couple of years uh, before that where I was working as a legislative aide for a, a member of US Congress. And look, we're gonna face new challenges, but I'm, I'm very excited to be part of the Texas Values team, not only because you are a fantastic group of people, but and I share a common world view with you. And I believe that we're entering not only a crucial time in our state, but a crucial time nationally. And it's, it's exciting to be part of an organization that's on the leading edge of pro-life issues and on the leading edge of pro-family and religious issues as well. Well, we appreciate you saying that. And it's great to have uh, someone like yourself with your background, your experience, and your insight and really the energy that you bring to the table and the focus on the work that we're doing. So we're excited about it. We now have 12 members of the Texas Values team. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit later in the show about how people can help us with that in. But let's not delay anymore. We've got a special guest today that's going to talk about issues of religious liberty, and we want to bring him right on. Ryan Tucker 
is a litigation attorney for Alliance Defending Freedom. He is from Texas. We're excited about that. Been licensed in Texas for many years, was in private practice, and then got to join the team at Alliance Defending Freedom. We've crossed paths several times. As a matter of fact, last year, we were at a, a really important church and citizen engagement event in the northwest part of Houston. Ryan, welcome to the Texas Values Report. Hey, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, always great to talk to fellow Texans. Well, look, and it's always great to hear people that are from Texas getting out about throughout the country, doing great and important work. And there's no question that's exactly what you're doing. And the partnership and the friendship we've had with Alliance Defending Freedom goes back many years. It's probably two decades now coming up and myself individually. And so, but I want to let you talk a little bit about some of the things that you're working on right now. We know that Alliance Defending Freedom continues to put out information, good insight on how to navigate things for churches and other religious and nonprofit entities as it relates to what's going on with the coronavirus, what go, is going on with some uh, restrictions. And a lot of this really came to a head over the weekend on Easter Sunday and uh, Easter weekend and Holy Week, because a lot of churches where you see a little bit more activity, I mean, let's just be honest, uh, you know, a, a lot of increase in people going to church during that week. And so you had churches trying to figure out also how to meet the needs of their people and just not be moved off the path all that much from what they usually do and serving as a part of the body of Christ. And so, but at the same time, many of them just trying to really navigate some of the things that the government said were the right things to do. And many of them tried to do that. And many of them were thoughtful and were responsible, but the local governments decided they would go even further and make it more difficult for them to exercise their religious freedom. And that related uh, resulted in some conflicts. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Like you said, I mean, a lot's been happening, uh, not just within the last week, but certainly the last 30 days. And so we've been monitoring uh, all of these uh, restrictions across the United States and, um, you know, hearing, you know, uh, actually a lot of good stories, too, in the process. It's not um, all negative news. And so we've been the recipients of, uh, of that welcome information as well. But uh, some of the more difficult circumstances, though, we have encountered are in places like Mississippi, where we had to, unfortunately, last week, uh, file a lawsuit on behalf of Temple Baptist. It's a small uh, rural uh, church uh, there in Greenville, and uh, they were uh, at their service on Wednesday night. They were listening to their pastor uh, preach over a small FM transmitter. No one was outside the vehicle. They were, uh, they had their windows up, and uh, about midway through the service, uh, eight uh, police officers uh, surrounded the uh, parking lot there at their, their church. There were less than 20 cars in the parking lot, and the officers proceeded to tap the windows. And as they rolled the windows down, they were greeted with a $500 citation. And uh, the reason they gave the citation is because about 24 hours prior to that, the city had instituted a drive-in church service ban. So this church, who is predominantly uh, older, uh, populated um, crowd, and uh, with very little access to social media, uh, this was really their sole option, really, to come together to worship. And they were doing so in a, in a safe and, I think, an effective manner. But their reward, unfortunately, was a, a citation. So we uh, got involved there. We filed a lawsuit last Friday. And uh, the Department of Justice, we're thankful for the administration coming in and filing a statement of interest in that case, uh, which you know underscores the, the significance of the issues there. And, just the unconstitutional nature of this order. This order was specific as to churches and uh, everyone's been the Sonic and literally there's a Sonic like two football fields down from this church. So people can go to Sonic, uh, sit right next to each other. They can order their burger and I, you know, I love Sonic but it's problematic that you can go to Sonic, get your burger, sit in that parking lot uh, right next to another vehicle. But if you do the exact same thing in Greenville, Mississippi, you're gonna get a ticket and, uh, and so filed suit. The mayor this week uh, came out and said, look, um, I'm going to get rid of those tickets. Uh, in fact, we're going to go change that order. And so we're hopeful that on this coming Tuesday that we'll have an order uh, that is uh, uh, more in line, if you will, with, with what the governor has already previously said. And so we'll wait to see how that uh, plays out in uh, Tennessee. But, you know, you talk about um, or in, in Mississippi, you talk about how can, you know, churches navigate these, these difficult times with sort of ever increasing uh, changes and orders. Well, this past uh, Saturday evening, right before Easter Sunday in Chattanooga, Tennessee, the uh, mayor there 
uh, issued an order saying no drive-in church services. And that threw several churches for a loop, several churches that had planned to, to host uh, services in a creative fashion like that. And so they um, had to quickly scrap those plans and uh, simply, if they were able to, do live stream. And uh, the mayor came out again this week and doubled down and uh, said, I don't care whether your windows are rolled up, rolled down, or um, in what fashion you do it, but we are going to ban drive-in services. And so we have um, connected with a church there in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and uh, we had reached out to the city trying to get the city to change course. Uh, the city was unresponsive, and so we also filed a lawsuit there in Tennessee, and uh, that was done uh, just yesterday. Uh, we also have... And I, I get real quick, Ryan, we're talking with Ryan Tucker. He serves as senior counsel and director of Center for Christian Ministries with Alliance Defending Freedom. They are a national nonprofit organization, primarily working on litigation, defending religious liberty, marriage and family, and pro-life issues. Ryan, we sent an email out uh, halfway through the week of Holy Week last week, letting people know our entire list, letting them know what their legal rights were, particularly hoping churches and people that go to church would catch up on this and see this. We got a great guidance letter from our Attorney General Ken Paxson, a Houses of Worship guidance letter. And specifically in this guidance letter was the example of drive-in services, because we'd already seen other churches do it in previous weeks as a way not to get around the law, but as a way to respect the law, but still exercise their religious freedom. And to your point, right, you got Sonic. I mean, you're from Texas. If you go to Whataburger these days, I was in Whataburger drive through the other day. You'll sit in a drive through 15, if not 30 minutes sometimes just trying to get, you know, your your combo meal. I'm sorry, your what a meal, as they call it there. But I mean, wherever you go, you know, if you're if you're and they're promoting drive through curbside services where people are sitting in parking lots. And so I, it just to your point, it's, it's a double standard. It's also um, an unfair application of the law. And that's when you run afoul. When the government treats the churches and religious entities different than others, it's no longer a generally applicable law. As we know, the Supreme Court has said some of those things can be okay. And so we appreciate you guys jumping on that. But we sent that email out early in the week to give people heads up so hopefully there, there wouldn't be any conflicts. We heard of some local governments in Texas, like Laredo and I think um, Cameron County, that at least seemed to indicate that they might have trouble with these type of drive-in services but we're able to get some information to them. And thankfully, we didn't have any law enforcement, any tickets being written. But look, that's the other side of this. People are hurting financially. Many of them are you know, just trying to make ends meet. And now they got to deal with a $500 ticket uh, for going to church on Easter Sunday. It's out of control. It, it, it totally is. And uh, like I said, this is an elderly population. Uh, it's uh, fixed income. And certainly during this, this time, in particular this time, uh, it's absolute insanity. And like you said, it's unconstitutional. You can't target the church. You can't single them out. You can't um, you know, treat them unfairly the way they certainly were done there and uh, also in Tennessee. And you know, thank goodness you guys are in Texas. Um, you, know, you got a lot of great leadership there in the state. And so we haven't had uh, as many calls, if you will. We've gotten a few. Um, and certainly I've, I've been watching some stuff going on down in Cameron County. But I... Uh, uh, I wish our time was being spent on other matters, I would say, but unfortunately, that's that's where we're at. But hopefully, maybe uh, you know, Governor Abbott and other governors across the United States will be um, issuing some orders here that uh, uh, that that open up um, our, our daily lives, and and maybe we can uh, get over this soon. We'll see. Well, and look, a lot of people are. These are about government rules that the churches are doing with, and if the government was smart. They'd be following the directions of not only their state attorneys general, at least the one in Texas, but also the attorney general of the United States. You mentioned the Justice Department put a statement of interest. I know Attorney General William Barr put out a statement of interest earlier this week or a statement, if you will, about these type of things and navigating CDC guidelines. And look, these churches aren't trying to be reckless. It's not like they've got a thousand people in their sanctuary that are sitting shoulder to shoulder. They're recognizing that there's a way to be safe and a way to be responsible, but still exercise their religious freedom. So it shows they're not trying to be, you know, turn their back or push back against the government. They're trying to just navigate what it, they've been told is OK. And the CDC guidelines, along with Attorney General William Barr, made it clear these type of driving services um, are legal. And it's a way to kind of balance um, the, the type of situations that we're dealing with these days. 
And so great to have someone like him at the attorney general's office there at the United States. And that would supersede whatever a local government thinks they're allowed to do. Am I right? Yeah, you, you, would, you would think that after the attorney general of the United States came out and commented on the situation in Mississippi that the, you know, that the mayor in Chattanooga, Tennessee would not double down. But unfortunately, he did. And so, uh, you know, we're hopeful that, uh, you know, we'll have a successful resolution there. But we'll see. We just filed the lawsuit. Uh, in Tennessee. And, and like I said, I so appreciate the, the leadership uh, there in Texas and, you know, how, you know, this is being handled. Uh, again, you have to though look at, at uh, not just the state level, you have to look at each individual uh, uh, city or county, because you can have these, these restrictions on a county or uh, citywide level, and you have to analyze each of those, you know, is the church being called out? Is it being targeted? Is it being treated unfairly? Uh, what's the duration of uh, the restriction? And so um, with so many uh, counties, so many cities there in Texas, there's, there's quite a lot of analysis that goes into that. Uh, but you know, that's, that's why we're here in case uh, folks need us to, to look into those situations for them. Well, let me have Jonathan Covey, our director of policy, jump in. Jonathan, you work for elected officials for many years. I can imagine you know, when you see crisis, I mean, you would hope, and I, I imagine the experience is a lot of government officials, strict the state level, they're looking at how can they protect the rights of individuals? How can they make sure that individuals get the basic services they need? And so, um, you know, these are probably the exceptions. They're bad exceptions, what we're seeing in other states. But I would imagine a lot of government officials, though, are focused now. And we heard from one earlier this week on how they can meet the needs of their constituents. Has that been your experience when you worked at the state capitol? Yeah, you know, I, I think that a lot of um a lot of local officials, you know, they have the the best interests of their constituents at heart. And I, you know, I've talked to local officials as well, but they seem to be really trying to um, come to the table and, uh, you know, understand how they can meet those needs. Sometimes um, it's possible that they overstep, maybe intentionally or unintentionally. But, uh, but um, you know, I, I think that I think that some of them are, I think some of them, some of them are certainly trying. So, um, and you know, and I hope I hope everyone. Um, out there is, you know, staying, staying safe and, you know, maintaining so, social distancing uh, properly. I know, I know I am. I'm, my only question is, how do you, how do you hire a, a barber on the dark web? It seems like Supercuts is no longer considered essential anymore. So. Yeah, well, I don't see any there, anyone behind you. So it looks like I, I won't report you. Okay. <laughs> I don't see anybody there in the background, but to your point, this is what we want government officials to know. If you have questions on these issues, there are smart, intelligent people that have experience, like Ryan Tucker, like our attorney general here in the state of Texas, Ken Paxson, our organization as well. We've got four members of our team that have a legal background. We're here to help. Our role is not, oh, every day, how can we say something negative and point something out about bad elected officials? M many of us, including Alliance Defending Freedom and others, have sent out these messages and emails, have done really our part to say, this is what the law allows. Here are some of the boundaries. Unfortunately, many of them don't listen. And a lot of times, too, before y'all file a lawsuit, there's at least an effort or, or a demand letter saying, hey, stop doing this, drop what you're doing, or we'll file a lawsuit. So they've had multiple opportunities. And so the ones we're talking about, Ryan, are the ones where you've been left with no choice. The only way to solve the issue is to go in and engage with litigation so they don't do it again. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime there's a chance, an opportunity to resolve something via letter, that you know, that's the preferred route. And you know, we have had success doing that. There's been many instances where orders have uh, you know simply been um, non-renewed, or they've been uh, modified in ways that uh, that really protect the interest of folks in in that particular locale. So we have had some success with that. But like you said, if uh, local officials don't listen uh, to uh, folks in the uh, in the academic or legal community, or even the Attorney General of the United States of America, then unfortunately litigation uh, ensues. And so we're having to go uh, that route uh, here with a few cases. But uh, you know, our hope is that uh, as these cases get litigated, as courts come out like they did in Kentucky with some favorable decisions, that uh, local officials understand um, you know what the uh, proper um, elements are for them to include in these orders and hopefully we'll see less of uh, these problematic uh, restrictions. 
Yeah, no, look, I mean, we're always hopeful too that people learn these valuable lessons when these type of conflicts happen. And we, we, we'd, we prefer to see less elected officials doing this, but we do want them to know that we're serious about what we believe in. And so if they continue to cross the line, they're gonna be held accountable. And that's the role that we're in. But there's an opportunity to avoid these type of things. And then sometimes an, an opportunity to develop a relationship. I know we've had that with other government officials where they're like, hey, we made a mistake. I want you on speed dial next time an issue like this comes up. And so it can be avoided because what you want is people to be able to go to church on Sunday and not be worried that the law enforcement is right behind their back, maybe putting a ticket so they can be focusing on developing their faith and not whether or not they're going to end up um, having to, you know, s spend a significant amount of money or God forbid, spend the night in jail when it comes to one of these issues, as we've seen sometimes people get out of control with their law enforcement power when they're not aware of what the law is, particularly on issues like this that have come up recently, right? And that's where I've been very encouraged to try to be a resource, sometimes in different areas of law, but we're not always a part of, and I know you're doing that as well. Um, Ryan Tucker is Senior Counsel for Alliance Defending Freedom. He's also the Director of Assistant Center for Christian Ministries. Ryan, give us the website for Alliance Defending Freedom or a phone number, whatever some of the best contact ways where people that are watching, maybe they're in Texas or maybe they're in other parts of the country that want to know how they can get in touch with you if they need help. Sure. If you go to adflegal.org, uh, first you'll see a lot about uh, our organization. Uh, but also, if you look on that screen, there, if you need uh, assistance, help with some legal matter, there's a legal help button. You can click on that button and uh, that'll lead you right uh, to us and uh, to our intake department and eventually to an attorney. Uh, if you're a church, uh, and uh, are looking for guidance there. We also have a program called the uh, Church Alliance. ADFChurchAlliance.org is the website for that, and ministries, religious organizations. We're also uh, receiving a ton of phone calls from them as well during this time, and we have uh, ADFMinistryAlliance.org. So if you go to ADFLegal.org, it'll send you to all three, of the, or all three of those or all two of those, but uh, you know that's the best place to start. And uh, there's a lot of good uh, resources, free resources on that, on those websites as well. Well, Ryan and all your team, we appreciate the work that you do. It's been going on for quite some time. I think Alliance Defending Freedoms in uh, what is 25th year, of, certainly over 20 years, been doing great work. We appreciate the friendship. We have so many great people from Texas. And I know a lot of volunteer attorneys that are part of the work. So God bless you and all the work you're doing in Alliance Defending Freedom. And we'll talk to you again soon on these important issues, Ryan. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Great work there with Texas Values and uh, appreciate all you Texans. Thanks, Ryan. Absolutely. Well, look, at, like I mentioned, it's been a busy week here in the state of Texas. A lot going on. We've seen some updates from the federal court on the pro-life issue. We know that our governor here in the state of Texas issued an executive order that only medical procedures that were necessary um, would continue to be used and allowed. That way sources, uh, resources could be conserved for dealing with the coronavirus. And guess who is the only set of entities or segment that has filed a lawsuit against this? There's only been one that we're aware of, according to the Attorney General's office and a call we were on yesterday, the abortion industry. All the other medical industries, the ophthalmologists, the dermatologists, I mean, you name it, they have all you know, and it's not been easy for them. Many of them have had to shut their practices down temporarily. We've heard in some hospitals um, that, that, are, that are not just having as much activity because things are being conserved. Coronavirus, abortion industry is the only one that has filed suit against this. This litigation has been going on for over two weeks, and most of it has been victorious by the state of Texas. We've been right there helping them. We submitted a amicus brief at the Fifth Circuit on behalf of 11 other states, including uh, Texas and other states. The court asked for that information. We also represented uh, some pro-life doctors and OBGYNs that have a medical background and, and can understand why this is important. So we've been victorious. There's been one case uh, or one instance, if you will, one segment that the court is allowed. We don't know that that's gonna continue, but that's medical abortions. Sometimes they can be a, a, a larger or a smaller percentage just depending on what type of facilities instinct but really, there were, I think there were four different categories, and three out of four, the core let stand as far as those abortions being halted. So if, if it was just the, the raw numbers from we can estimate, there's about 140 abortions every year in the state of, excuse me, every day in the state of Texas based on 2017 statistics, which are the most re recent statistics we have. 
That would mean during the 13 to 14 days that the court has said that it's okay to halt these abortion procedures and other, other medical procedures that the court said these are not essential, all right? That's close to 2,000 lives that have been saved because of the leadership of our attorney general and for our governor. But it's also important to think about that. We're worried right now, right, about the protection of lives. And so you'd think that that'd be a good thing, but it's not for the abortion industry because they care more about taking lives uh, than they do about preserving lives. And, and they care more about themselves where the rest of us are trying to be team players and adjust. They have said no. They're trying to spend time, court resources and all that to, to clog up or to um, focus on what's happening in court. And there's been a lot filed. OK, I wouldn't even have enough time in a, in a 30 minute segment of our show to go through the chronology of just over the past two and a half weeks. But we're thankful to the attorney general's office. We've been front and center on that issue as well. We'll continue to be whether whether it means we got to file things in court representing other entities that have an angle on this or what have you or just messaging on it. We're going to do it. And that's why I want you to continue to see that there's value in the work that we do. 15 seconds, Jonathan Covey, to jump in. How'd you enjoy your first segment of the Texas Values Report? Fantastic, Jonathan. Thanks for inviting me, having me on, and I look forward to hopefully getting to uh, visit with viewers in the future, but thanks so much. Yeah, that's our new director of policy, Jonathan Covey. You're going to hear and see more from him in our work, but look, that's because people like you have supported our work financially. We're starting to see a little bit of impact and, and some you know communication from some of our supporters that are struggling, of course, with the coronavirus don't let that happen to us, though. Don't let our ability to help you and others in the state of Texas on these issues go down. Let's increase it, okay? Um, we're going to have some opportunities to match donations coming up in the next month or so, but you don't have to wait for that. You can make a tax-deductible donation right now. Go to txvalues.org, make that tax-deductible donation. We are a nonprofit organization, so we can continue to do the work we do for faith, family, and freedom in Texas. And we'll talk to you next week on the Texas Values Report.